There was a second dam at the San Fernando site. This is known as the Upper San Fernando Dam. And this structure also was subjected, obviously, to the same earthquake as the lower dam at the same time. But what is interesting about this case history, that uh, it is one of the cases where there was large deformations, but the structure itself did not totally collapse, and the reservoir was not lost or drained. And so it is of particular significance when we want to look at what is the a permanent deformation during earthquake shaking and is the deformation such that the structure will not completely collapse. The steps in this particular case are very very similar to the lower San Fernando Dam but the results are somewhat different. In this particular case there were large post-earthquake permanent deformations, but the structure remained marginally stable at the end of the shaking. So once again, here is the GeoStudio analysis tree. Once again, we start with SEEP, and we set up the long-term steady-state poor pressure conditions. And then we use quake or sigma to establish the in situ stress state. And once again, we look at the factor of safety overall using slope before the shaking. Then we use the results in quake to do the shaking and looking at possible zones of liquefaction and excess poor water pressure. And then once again, we use the quake results in slope to look at the factor of safety at the end of the shaking, both overall and on the downstream berm. And then finally, we use the results once again in a sigma analysis to do a stress redistribution type of analysis and look at the permanent deformations. So very briefly then, here are the results. Once again, as you will note that before the earthquake, under static conditions, the margin of safety against sliding was very high, well over two, the same as the lower San Fernando Dam. And once again, here is the result after the Quake W analysis, and we see once again that we have the soil grain structural collapse and strength fell down to the steady state strength resulting in liquefaction. And the analysis indicates that there were potentially two zones of liquefaction which is consistent with the publications on this case history. So following the same procedure then as we did for the lower San Fernando Dam, and we look at the stability after the earthquake, but before we do that, here is a picture of the excess pore pressures. These are the excess pore pressures at the end of the shaking, and we see that the largest excess pore pressures obviously were in the zones where there was potential for liquefaction and where there was liquefaction. So then returning back to the margin of safety, if we now take where the slip surfaces passes through an element that has been flagged as liquefied, it has a reduced strength, and we can see here that at the end of it all, the overall margin of safety was close to unity. In other words, the structure was marginally stable right at the end of the shaking. Note that the red zone is a factor of safety between about 1.06 and 1.16. The other thing that is of interest is that the critical slip surface here, according to these predictions, is just below the, full, the reservoir level at this time when the shaking took place. And in fact, the head scarp 
was not noticeable until the reservoir had been drained, so this is consistent with the response of the structure after the shaking. So once again, we follow the same procedure as in the lower San Fernando Dam, and in this particular case, we have done a stress redistribution analysis in sigma, and uh, the maximum displacement that we compute is approximately 1.5 meters when the long, when the steady state, the undrained steady state strength is around 35 kPa. It's worth noting, however, that the displacement is very sensitive to the undrained strength we use, but nonetheless, uh, I won't go into any details here. It is described in the Upper San Fernando Dam example we ship with the software, but uh, this value, there is a basis for it based on the research that has been done on what the undrained steady state strength might be. Now once again, the magnitude is of interest, that is true, but the displacement field itself is also of significant interest. And we can see here that there was down and out movement at the crest. At the base of this upper berm, the movement was predominantly horizontal. And this is consistent with the field observations that were made after the earthquake was over. There was also a very significant bulge that had formed in this area here, and the displacement field is also consistent with that. And also this displacement field would suggest that there are perhaps two modes of movement here. There is a localized movement on this downstream berm, but there is also some overall movement. Once again, I think it is consistent with the observation as to how this structure performed during the earthquake. So then what were the key issues with the Upper San Fernando Dam? Once again, it was the generation of excess pour water pressures. It was the collapse of the soil grain structure. It was the strength reduction down to the steady state strength and the damage occurred after the earthquake was over and it was the post-earthquake deformations that were the main issue in the performance of the structure and once again to note it was not let me repeat it was not the mass times acceleration forces that were the main driving force that caused the instability let me repeat again, the mass times acceleration forces obviously were a part in the generation of the pore pressures, but the instability occurred after the shaking had stopped. So that is a brief description of the types of analyses that can be done with GeoStudio for a case history like the Upper San Fernando Dam where there was liquefaction generation of excess pore pressures and strength loss.